Ho ho ho, and welcome to the show. Today, instead of a review, we take another dive into literary adjacent trivia regarding the Christmas season. Take it away, classic novelist. Ah, salutations and welcome to the show. I'm your host, the classic novelist. As the snow starts to fall and you curl up on the couch to watch a classic holiday film with a mug of hot cocoa surrounded by friends and family, it may interest you to know some interesting trivia tidbits about some of those works that have ended up in the pop culture's traditional zeitgeist. For example, you may be familiar with the poem A Visit from St. Nicholas, but do you know who wrote it? Don't be so sure. Twas the night before Christmas, and all through the house, not a creature was stirring. Not even a mouse. A Visit from St. Nicholas was first published anonymously in the Troy Sentinel newspaper on December 23, 1823. It originated several elements that would go on to become well-known aspects of the Santa Claus mythos, the fat and jolly archetype that is permeated throughout almost all modern pop culture. While the story borrowed other elements that had previously been established, such as the sleigh and reindeer, which are originally from a different American poem titled The Children's Friend, the story gained popularity following publication, being reprinted several times after, and is still published on Christmas in newspapers to this day. And in 1844, author Clement Clark Moore claimed credit for it after it had been attributed to him starting in 1837. However, there are some serious doubts to that claim, and a few literary historians find it to be dubious. Moore claims to have composed the poem for his daughters after taking a sleigh ride on a snowy winter's day, and based St. Nick on both a local Dutch handyman and the historic St. Nicholas. Professor Donald Foster argues that Moore was incapable of having written it, due to his temperament and style being vastly different than the poem as we know it. But others, including Seth Caller, an expert in authenticating historic documents and former owner of one of the original manuscripts for A Visit from St. Nicholas, wholeheartedly believes the claims against Moore as the author are unfounded and bogus, and had his manuscript checked and did copious research into the claims to prove that Moore was in fact the author. Having reviewed the research myself, I'm inclined to believe Caller's research, especially given that claiming someone is incapable of writing something festive because of their temperament is a ridiculously close-minded claim to make. Not to mention that a lot of the arguments are character assassinations against Moore, and not literary related or pertaining to the poem itself. The purported true author is Henry Livingston Jr., whose children claim to have heard their father read them the poem years before its publication, and claim to have owned the original manuscript, which was rather conveniently destroyed in the house fire. It's also worth noting that both human memory is ridiculously fallible, and Livingston himself never claimed to have written the poem, nor is there any evidence from the time that links his name to the poem. We may never know the whole truth about whether or not Livingston's children were lying or mistaken, but what we do know is that the poem had a huge effect on Christmas in America. At the time of publication, there were very strong feelings against Christmas, since it was, according to Protestants, rife with Catholic ignorance and deception. But the poem, with the stronger focus on the character of St. Nicholas and shifting the religious connotations to a more general focus on the children receiving gifts aspect, made the holiday something that everyone could get behind. In some ways, it paved the way for the traditional American Christmas as we know it today. Additionally, did you know that three lines of the story that you might think you know well are actually modern alterations? The moon on the breast of the new fallen snow is typically balderized into the crest of the new fallen snow, and the penultimate line, as St. Nick departs, is typically, but I heard him exclaim as he drove out of sight, is actually meant to be, but I heard him exclaim, ere he drove out of sight, which actually changes when Santa gives his exclamation in the timeline of the story. Plus, his final exclamation of Merry Christmas to all and to all a good night was originally the English Happy Christmas. Speaking of English Christmas greetings, did you also know that there are some things you might not know about the Charles Dickens classic A Christmas Carol? For example, 
Did you know that Dickens started writing the story in October of 1843 and finished it in just six weeks, just enough time to get it published for Christmas? Dickens also did several live readings of the novel, one of the first writers to do so. That can be considered the first adaptation of the story, the first performance being in 1853 for a crowd of 2,000. He even had a special prompt copy of the story with stage directions for them. He continued doing live performances of the story up until 1870, when his health deteriorated, eventually leading to his death that same year. Out of curiosity, which do you think is the most faithful adaptation of A Christmas Carol? Is it the 2009 Disney animated version starring Jim Carrey? Or could it be the 1935 version starring Seymour Hicks? Is it Mr. Magoo's Christmas Carol? The answer might surprise you. It's The Muppet's Christmas Carol. I know that's surprising, but due to the fact that the film has Gonzo take on the role of Dickens giving narration, that means that whole swaths of the text were taken straight from the book, and even the bulk of the dialogue is ripped straight off the page. For example, there's the Christmas present scene where Scrooge witnesses his nephew and his friends making fun of him on Christmas morning, which for the longest time I thought was a Muppets original, because it felt like the traditional Muppets mayhem. So imagine my surprise when I finally read the book cover to cover last year and discovered that it was from the original text. Not to mention that Michael Caine, who was one of the finest actors to ever play Scrooge, arrived at that performance because he approached the film like he was doing it with the Royal Shakespeare Company instead of the Muppets. He was acting as if he was in a straight adaptation, and as such, has a brilliant straight man performance to balance the typical Muppet mania. Speaking of characters who dislike Christmas... Did you know that while he shares the first two letters of his name with the color he'd be given in successive adaptations, the Grinch, you know, who stole Christmas, wasn't green in the original 1957 Dr. Seuss book? The color was chosen for the 1966 animated TV special, which was directed and produced by some little-known animator named Chuck Jones, who never did anything else of note, so you've probably never heard of him. And while this isn't strictly book-related, the 1966 special featured Boris Karloff as both the narrator and the voice of the Grinch, which wasn't the first time Karloff portrayed an adaptationally green and misunderstood character from a book, as Karloff is most well-known for his portrayal of the monster in the 1931 Universal Pictures Frankenstein film. In addition, did you know that the inspiration for the Grinch was actually Dr. Seuss himself? In an interview with Red Book in 1957, Seuss stated that he got the idea to write the book from seeing himself in the mirror on the day after Christmas. I was brushing my teeth on the morning of the 26th of last December when I noticed a very Grinchish countenance in the mirror. It was Seuss! Something had gone wrong with Christmas, I realized, or more likely with me. So I wrote the story about my sour friend the Grinch to see if I could rediscover something about Christmas that obviously I'd lost. I don't know if he rediscovered his love of Christmas or not, but he definitely created an enduring classic, with three major adaptations being released in the last 20 years. And while there's likely countless more Christmas-related book trivia to cover, I think I'll stop here. After all, there's Christmas festivities to be had. Until next time. And I heard him exclaim as the video came to a close, Merry Christmas to all. Let's all enjoy some prose. Come back next year. See you then. Moore claims to have composed the poem for his daughters after taking a sleigh ride on a slowy winter on a slowy winter's day.